Thanks for listening to the Wild Health Podcast. For the foreseeable future, you're not going to hear our normal intro or outro here. We're going to be releasing episodes very frequently as things are changing. This channel will be used for a very specific purpose. Number one, to communicate with our patients. We're somewhat overwhelmed, and the more we can communicate breaking news and recommendations from us to our patients all at once, the better. So if you're a patient, we're here for you if you need us. But if possible, please tune in here so we can both keep you up to date and conserve our time for the most critical tasks. Feel free to share this with friends and colleagues as well. Number two, we've organized as a group. We have infectious disease specialists, ER doctors, critical care doctors, and in total dozens of MDs, PhDs, and frontline clinicians who are going to be constantly evaluating the news and emerging evidence. We're then going to summarize and translate that for you here every day on the podcast. The speed of change with the circumstances will make us look foolish at times, but we're committed to pouring all of our resources and energy into doing what we can to help and make a difference. You can also follow our updates at wildhealth.com or our Instagram account at wildhealthmd. And if you're a patient, we're here for you. Please tune in here for the updates and let us know how we can help. Dr. Michael Mallon, happy March 31st to you. Today is Tuesday, and we're going to give you the COVID-19 situation report and update for this Tuesday evening. In the United States, as of Monday evening, yesterday, the CDC reported 163,000 confirmed cases and 2,800 deaths in the United States. This represents a 16% increase in cases and 19% increase in deaths from the previous day. Those percentage increases are slightly smaller than what we've been reporting, but we're also talking about bigger numbers as well. So on on first blush, they seem a little encouraging, but it's still large numbers we're talking about. As of this afternoon, Worldometer reported 182,000 cases and 3,600 deaths in the United States as of noon, March 31st. Yeah, Matt, we are seeing a a decrease in the increase of the number of cases and deaths, but the death rate in the U.S. is still doubling every 2.6 days. In New York, it's actually 2.0 days. And if we take this trajectory and assume that we don't see any significant flattening of the curve, the death toll is going to hit 100,000 by April 11th and 200,000 by April 14th. But I'm hopeful that since the deaths are lagging behind the cases and and the rate at which the cases are being identified by about 14 days or so, maybe just 10 days, we're going to see a flattening of the death curve as we have the total number of cases. And we're not talking about these numbers to be fear-mongering. We just do think it's important to report accurate data. We think people are responsible enough and smart smart enough that we're going to give accurate data here. So Globally, data from the Financial Times shows that the U.S. continues to have more confirmed cases than any other country in the world. Italy has joined the U.S. as the only other country to have surpassed 100,000 cases, although Spain is close behind with close to 95,000 cases. In the U.S. specifically, the outbreak in New York continues to be the largest in the nation with more than 75,000 confirmed cases. And experts are predicting that the peak is still two to three weeks away. Just today, someone sent me a video that has gone somewhat viral, and it was somewhat disturbing to me because the video was of someone going to a couple New York hospitals. Actually, it was one specific hospital, and it was a smaller hospital, and they were videotaping the fact that there were no lines outside, no one trying to get testing, and they were trying to make the point that they thought it was a big conspiracy and that the numbers being reported were not real. So this really bothered me because I'm talking to people on the front lines there, and it is real. So I actually texted and called a couple friends and to see, hey, what is going on? And one ER and ER physician in New York City sent me a couple statistics. They said, number one, uh, last night in EMS, this was on the 26th, so March 25th. On March 25th, there were 6,406 medical 911 calls in New York, the highest volume ever, surpassing 911. They also reported that a couple days ago, normally there are 60 field cardiac arrests per day, but EMS responded to 300 that day, a five times increase. An anesthesiologist who works in the ICU told me that numbers, quote unquote, underplay how bad it is. It is really, really bad. At their hospital, every intubated patient with COVID has died so far, and they asked to not be named the hospital and the provider. Another ICU doctor uh, who we know personally, these are not just kind of random quotes from people, said we're out of ventilators, we're out of viral filters, 
and the people dying are young. No one is making up numbers in New York City. They are all real. I wish it was otherwise. So as easy as it is to get clicks when you put out a video like that or, or push forward conspiracy theories, it's not helpful. And it's really insulting to the people on the front lines. So don't do it. The U.S. and South Korea both reported their first cases of COVID-19 on the same day in January. And I think it's interesting to look at the two countries and see what potentially test and trace program can do. South Korea did seem to flatten their curve based on this test and tra trace program that they had. So this week, the United States surpassed the total number of coronavirus tests that South Korea has performed. We have a much larger population, about six times larger than South Korea. So it's interesting to look at what our numbers are now without much testing compared to what South Korea's numbers are when we had the first case on the same day. In South Korea, they have a total number of 9,786 cases, whereas we have 184,000. Today, they had 125 new cases compared to our 20,000 new cases. They had four new deaths today, and we had 615. Now, those numbers are a bit skewed because, like I mentioned, we are larger than they are. But if you just look at total deaths per 1 million population, so normalized per population, the U.S., since that first case in January for each country, has about four times as many deaths. So I bring this up not to uh, just say how bad the U.S. has done, but I bring this up because the U.S. is very uneven. Some places it's bad and some places it is not. So I don't think it's too late in some places to potentially consider this test and trace program. And I don't think it's too late for us to learn some lessons from this and potentially apply in places where we don't have a big outbreak yet and we could potentially prevent it a little bit kind of like South Korea did. The New York Times reports that social distancing measures are contributing, contributing to noticeable drops in fevers around the country. According to data from Kenza Health, a medical tech firm that produces smart thermometers, the group created a national map of fever levels using aggregates of real-time temperature data and immediately identified a downtrend in fever levels following the implementation of social distancing measures. Now, this doesn't mean that COVID-19 cases are declining, but it does confirm that social distancing measures like school closures and stay-at-home orders can effectively slow down the spread of COVID-19. Matt, with regard to the test and trace uh, comments that you were making comparing uh, South Korea and the, and the U.S., I read an article today that actually suggested that only um, there there's still one third of U.S. counties that have zero COVID cases and um, about 85 percent of those are in rural areas. So it might actually be a great opportunity to start performing the test and trace program in these places, in these smaller rural counties because that's a, sort of an opportunity for us to continue social distancing um, in places that haven't blown up, that, that aren't New York City, that aren't Seattle, that aren't California. So there, there's still a fairly significant part of the country that is at the very beginning of the curve and is, is not as far along as some of these ur more urban areas. So I think you're right. I think, I think the opportunity is there. We just, unfortunately, we got to get the testing there, and it's not currently. Yeah, and I, I worry about those areas, Mike. I know a lot of people in those rural areas, and it seems like they feel like they're somewhat insulated because of um, how spread out they are and how far they are away from these epicenters. But what I can tell you is, having worked in areas like that, they if they do have an outbreak, they are at really high risk. There just are not the medical facilities to take care of a large number of critical critically ill patients. So while they may be slightly lagging behind, if they do have a similar outbreak is some of the larger, more dense areas, they're going to be in um, a lot of trouble. And what's important to, to note also is that, you know, the, the proportion of people in those areas are older. So our, our elderly in this country are more, uh, more consistently in the rural areas. So people over 60 years old, and they're the people that are highest risk. So in, really, in, in a lot of ways, these areas are, have the most at-risk population and also have the most at-risk um, healthcare system in that they don't have the ability to, to scale up like some of the urban centers do. So this is, this is our opportunity to, to help prevent that from happening in some of these, these rural areas. Several uh, other articles to, to review today. Uh, the the uh, Imperial College of London just released a model on nature.com that suggests that in Europe alone, between 21,000 and 120,000 lives have been saved as of today's date through social distancing alone. 
the article went on to make the case that uh, rural areas have seen zero to near zero COVID positive cases, which is more proof that social distancing works. Uh, again, just more proof that social distancing is working in certain parts of the country. We need to add in and test and trace in order to get the biggest bang for our buck. Another letter was uh, published to Lancet. This was on March 27th. It was entitled, A Role for CT in COVID-19, What the Data Really Tells Us So Far. The letter comments on a study released early in the pandemic from China suggesting about a 97% sensitivity for CT scan in the diagnosis of COVID-19. Now, Matt, you and I talked about this study uh, early on in the podcast, and I think our comments basically had to do with the fact that this was an endemic area. They were only testing symptomatic patients. And this letter was nice because it kind of confirmed some of our concerns regarding the study. So they said that uh, a competing study was recently released, and this was from the Diamond Princess cruise ship, and it only found a 60% positive rate of CT in patients who had a positive PCR test. So much lower sensitivity for CT. The thinking here being that instead of having a population where you're only testing symptomatic patients, now you're testing basically basically everyone who was on the cruise ship. And for that reason, you're getting a much lower positive rate with CT. And this, to me, this makes sense. I don't think CT has much role in the, in the initial diagnosis of COVID-19. Yeah. And operating characteristics of any test, whether it's CT or, or whatever it is going to go, are going to go, the sensitivity and specificity are going to change based on the prevalence. And we were somewhat concerned when we saw this 97% sensitivity study that people were going to start trying to do this. And we talked about the problems with CT scanning for this for many other reasons as well, just resource utilization, having to terminally clean the CT scan, it being out of commission for traumas and other things like that as well. So this is good. It's just another kind of nail in the coffin of saying why we can't CT patients for COVID-19. Got some good news. Dr. Jacob Glanville of a company called Distributed Bio recently had a discussion with the news, and here's the quote. We took a series of five antibodies from around 2002 that were able to neutralize SARS. We were able to use technology in our laboratories to evolve those antibodies against SARS to adapt them to recognize COVID-19. We tried with five different antibodies because we weren't sure which one would work the best. All five worked. So we've got a pretty powerful tool chest available to us right now to produce a final therapeutic. This is interesting. So this is a potential way to take old antibodies that were used that were from the initial SARS virus. They've just modified them and now they're supposedly working against COVID-19. Now it's important to remember this is really early. This isn't even in phase one or phase two trials. So right now they're testing the antibodies. They're getting secondary testing from other companies. And what is likely going to happen is we're going to start to see these antibodies go into phase one and phase two trials on humans. But unfortunately that's probably not until the end of summer. Yeah, I think this is really hopeful, too, because I'm every day someone asks me, okay, when are we going to be able to get back to normal? When are we going to be able to relax these measures? And we keep kind of sounding the alarm as to why it's not a good idea to do it quickly. But I, th I think time is on our side. Every day we see a new article about a potential therapeutic and something that's coming out. So I feel like if we can just hold tight and keep that curve somewhat flat, push it down a little bit, science and the fact that all of humanity is, is kind of working together on this, we're going to get some really good therapeutics and some good treatments. So it's not that we're going to have to all be holed up in our house forever. We just have to really, in the next couple of weeks, what we do is going to have a really big effect. And if we can just buy ourselves some time, some really cool stuff is coming out. When was the last time in your life, Matt, that the, the entirety of humanity was fighting the same thing? It's insane. Yeah, it's, it's really impressive to watch. Every time I think about this, it just blows my mind. I mean, it, I, I think we're going to look back on this and just be totally amazed at what humanity is capable of doing when everyone puts the puts all of their efforts towards the same thing. I really do. I think I, I'm hopeful that this is going to this is going to turn out in a really positive manner, and I think it's going to it's going to speak to what we're capable of doing when we put our minds to it. Yeah, I, I think, and I'm hopeful that this will really kind of bring the globe together in a way that um, we really need. I mean, there's more and more kind of nationalist rhetoric over the last several years, five to 10 years. And this could really be as horrific as it is the catalyst that really kind of brings us together and uh, stops pitting us against each other and kind of decreases some of the tribalism we see. 
All right, two more articles to go over. These are pretty quick ones. The Journal of Medical Virology. They did something kind of interesting. They traced the viral genome of several infected people in Italy and Germany and a, a few other countries, and they were able to trace back the viruses and try to figure out when the viruses actually got to each of these areas. They actually found that the COVID-2 virus was present in Germany before it was present in Italy, and it was likely spreading for like three weeks before the outbreaks were detected in both places. Now, this isn't really surprising. And I remember talking to a lot of my colleagues early on in this, in, in this whole pandemic, talking about how this has probably been around for weeks and we just didn't know about it. And it's interesting because this article is actually proving that. Another article, uh, two of them actually, um, with regard to the presence of COVID-19 in uh, the feces and a possible fecal oral transmission. This is interesting that a small case report of three children in China who tested positive um, and then were in the hospital, discharged from the hospital. They were discharged after they had negative nasal swabs, but then they went and tested their feces 10 days later, and they actually found that the virus remained in their feces for an extended period of time. Now, this isn't proof that you can necessarily transmit the virus from the feces because the presence of virus doesn't mean that it can still infect somebody, but it is concerning and it could help explain why we're seeing uh, so much more transmission from children despite their minimal symptoms. And it also brings into question, how long does it really take before you're no longer passing the virus to other people? I don't think we know the answer to that question yet. Um, we're going to be releasing a podcast on mental health for frontline providers. So if you are a frontline provider, I think we've got some good advice for you. There was a JAMA article that came out, uh, really high rates of insomnia, depression, PTSD for frontline providers in China. And if you are a frontline provider, listen in tomorrow morning as we talk to our director of mental health, Dr. Kristen Dawson. And if you're not a frontline provider and you know one, listen in so you can hear how you can support them. Thanks so much for listening to this COVID-19 update. Please send us your questions or follow along on Instagram and Facebook at WildHealthMD. And just to be clear, this is not medical advice. No patient-physician relationship has been established, and this resource is really for general informational purposes only. And finally, if you want to spread the word, please send this podcast to friends and family and give us a review on iTunes. Thanks again, and stay safe.